Well, good morning, uh, everyone. Welcome to Hope Chapel, Johnstown, New York, on this beautiful Sunday morning. I'm going to take us to uh, Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, the book of Acts. It's the New Testament, book of Acts, uh, chapter 2 and verse 38. Uh, the setting here is the day of Pentecost. Uh, it's a lot of new beginnings, new things happening, and uh, Peter uh, is standing among the crowd, and he begins to uh, speak, and we're coming in at, a, at, at one little part of his message, a very important message, uh, but we'll, we want to take this text and expand on it a little bit in terms of what we could call the gift, the gift, or what uh, God has delivered to us, what have, have we received from God in terms of this great gift, uh, and then especially in the person of the Holy Spirit. And we're not going to be focusing a whole lot on the Holy Spirit uh, at this point, but hopefully next week a little bit more on the Holy Spirit, but this week uh, a little broader understanding about what is this gift that we're talking about. Uh, Acts chapter 2 and verse 30, again, this is, this is Peter, now the Apostle Peter speaking on the day of Pentecost, and he says, uh, well, verse 38 to begin with, says, and Peter said to them, to them, to the Jews and others who were uh, within listening uh, sound of his voice, um, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So what is this gift that God has delivered to us? Here it says expressly that it's the Holy Spirit. Uh, I want to say that uh, this, is, this is truly a gift, but then we want to look at this within the broader understanding of what the Bible also calls the gift of, e of eternal life. So just a question at the outset, have you ever received a gift and then you just left it unopened? Uh, that would be a rare occasion because usually um, we're pretty excited about uh, receiving gifts simply because of the anticipation of what's inside this, this thing, especially if we've dropped those hints, you know, to the one that is, that is uh, giving it to us in terms of this is something that we need, this is something that we want, we're all, we're all excited about it. But I think uh, the key word there uh, is the word received received, received, received. And we find this multiple times in the book of Acts, uh, received, received, received. And we really want to pay attention to that because uh, to receive something then is passive, not active. Active is to give something. But to receive something is the passive side of it, right? You're the receiver of this. So you're doing nothing but allowing this thing to be delivered to you. And I think we have to pay attention to that, especially when we come to understanding the gift that God gives us with eternal life, with the Holy Spirit, um, in terms of being on the receiving end. You know, what was God's part? What was our part? You know, in, in terms of that. And so the Bible is clear to tell us that we're receivers. So there's something that um, is in our hands, so to speak, and something that is merely to be appreciated, uh, received, appreciated, something like that, but certainly opened, right? Certainly opened. We don't just leave uh, this gift unopened. So for the Christian, for the Christian then, salvation, or, or to really unpack that word a little bit, deliverance from the guilt of sin, the shame associated with our sin, this is described in the Bible as a gift from God or the gift from God, to be more specific. So uh, we can't earn it. Uh, it's to be received by faith uh, and then enjoyed in the experience of this new life or the Christian life. So a lot of times, especially in our, our present day, uh, the modern era, we, the, word, the word Christian tends to be a label. Salvation tends to be a label and we forget really to unpack that. You know, what is the experience of that? What does it mean to be a Christian and to live this life? What is that about? And we want to just talk a little bit about that today. Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. So the gift of God now is eternal life. So we say, what, what is this gift? And we'd say, well, that's salvation. But now Paul, the Apostle Paul, says, well, well um, it, it's eternal life. So now he's, he's, if we draw a big circle and put at the top, label it salvation, what do we put inside of that? And one of the things would be eternal life. Now, 
Paul, of course, is writing these words, and Paul used the Greek language to convey the meaning of that. That is, we have some manuscript originally that's in Greek, uh, whether Paul is speaking Greek in certain places and parts, and maybe among the Jews speaking Aramaic, but he's writing this in the New Testament in the Greek language, and, the, and there are different words for gift, as you can imagine, right? So in English, we have the word gift, but then um, if you're used to uh, someone teaching you the Bible and making reference to either the Hebrew in the Old Testament or the Greek in the New Testament and some parts of Daniel and other places, even the Aramaic language. But here, the Greek is charisma, charisma. Um, so, so why would that be significant? Or why would Paul use that particular word? What do I think he's emphasizing by using the word uh, charisma um, in this particular context, when he says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God, the gift, the charisma, is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, some, you might have an English Standard Version Bible, for example, and in the ESV, as we could call it, um, the translation then of charisma is the free gift. So gift is modified, you know, the, the, the free gift as though... Well, is that what's being emphasized by the Greek term charisma? In other words, eternal life is a free gift. And doesn't that underscore what we said earlier? It's a gift. We're the passive recipients of that. There it is. It's put in our hands. Here's the gift. Will we open it? Will we appreciate it? Will we utilize it? You know, will we ignore it, neglect it, reject it? You know, this is what the Bible speaks about in terms of, of charisma um, and refers to something uh, very, very basically that's presented to you at no cost. That's the emphasis. And of course, you know, we get the same thing with gift, right? That's the nature of a gift. Nobody earns a gift. So you might, you might earn an award, something like that, but a gift altogether different. So I don't think we, we lose much in the translation, do we? I mean, I think we get it. We get it. You know, a gift is a, something that's provided for us at, at no cost. But I think with charisma, you have to understand that there's also this word charis in there, which is the word for grace, okay? So that sort of goes along with the nature of it being given to us. In other words, to say it this way, someone was so generous toward you that they purchased something for you, packaged it, delivered it to you so that it, the gift, could be received by you freely at no cost. So, so keep that in mind as we consider you know, the gift of God, you know, this notion that God has given us something that we are simply to be on the receiving ends of it, and it's at no cost. Now, you, know, you can be given a lot of things that didn't cost you any. They're gifts, and they're, they're kind of cheap. You know, a lot of people are just giving away stuff as... as uh, promotional bits for their company or something, and you say, yeah, okay, I'll try it. Or it's a free sample of something. It's a gift, technically, and you'll try it. So you have to understand with charisma, when it's in terms of God giving it, that this is something that although it cost us nothing, it is a gift of his grace. And we'll get a little bit further into that in just a moment, but just keep that in the back of your mind in terms of this gift, eternal life. So when, when, when the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord, those words roll off the tongue, we memorize the passage, and yet we fail at the depth or the import of each of those words. What it cost God is though God bankrupted heaven in order to provide you with this most precious gift. So if we say that the free gift... The free gift, as the ESV puts it, and I think it's okay to modify it that way. There's certainly a fuller understanding of, of gift there. The free gift of eternal life, you, have to, you probably could modify it further and say the, the um, incalculable worth or the supreme preciousness of this free gift, eternal life. And that's kind of how we have to understand it. Well, Paul used similar language in Romans chapter 3 and verse 24. Now, this is going back. Remember the first Romans 6, 23. Now go back a little bit to Romans chapter 3 and verse 24. And what does 3, 24 say? Paul laying even more foundation of this understanding of, of gift. And he says, being justified as a gift 
by his grace. And now he brings grace into this because he is going to change the word that he uses for a gift from charisma to Dorian. Dorian, from charisma to Dorian. You say, well, why would he do that? But here is the inclusion of grace, which was already packed into that charisma, right? So the idea that it's, it's a result of God's grace. Somebody that gives you this gift freely is one who is gracious at his very uh, center of his being. So a gracious, gracious individual. Uh, so, so with Dorian, uh, how does this emphasize a, diff- a different aspect of both the gift that is given and maybe highlight a different part of the nature of the giver? So uh, I, 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 would, I would probably suggest that the word emphasizes uh, or places emphasis, I should say, on the one who is the giver uh, and the gracious nature in which one uh, gives, okay? So, so this is God, God acting in grace to bestow this incalculable uh, uh, gift of, of such great uh, 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 value upon us. But then I also think it, it emphasizes the one who receives, okay? So, so I've said that the gift of eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord is to be received, Receive, receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Remember from Acts 2, 38. So on the received side, we're looking at this. So what does Dorian really emphasize that charisma perhaps may not emphasize as much? And that is the undeservedness of of the person on the receiving end. That's what we have to, you know, it's it's one thing for someone to give you a gift at no cost and then to have you think, okay, but... But I've done some work for them, you know. I, I've done some work, and they're, and they're really giving me, me this gift in exchange. It, technically, yeah, it's a gift. I get it. You're, you're giving this to me. But, but it's really in exchange for some work that I've done for you. And this could not be further from what is represented here by the Apostle Paul in this word, Dorian. This means it's someone that uh, receives something, and it's totally unmerited, uh, you're, you're un, you, you haven't done anything to earn it. You're not worthy of it, so you don't deserve it. And the idea of don't deserve it really goes to the heart of the issue. It, it means, <clears throat> really, Dorian was used in some of the uh, classical context as uh, uh, maybe somebody would, would, uh, would expect, based on some, some wage that they were given, that there's a particular... Um, gift that is associated that that would somehow equate with that. And so, so Paul is, is saying here really that, that no, no, this is a gift that, that is not given in exchange for services rendered. It's not a gift given uh, uh, because uh, in giving that gift, the, the giver is going to increase his stature with you or, or something. You have to strip all of that away. And this is the nature of the gift of God. This is the nature of salvation. It's not given to us in exchange for uh, some work that, that we have done or as an equivalent for all of your hard work. No, salvation is provided by God to the unworthy and to the undeserving. This is what God would have us know at the very depth of our being. If we're to fully appreciate the gift that he's given to us, we first come to him as sinners and say, you know, I'm just unworthy, I'm undeserving. <laughs> Listen, you may know, you may be that person or you may know people in your life who, who sort of stay at arm's length from Christianity and from Christians simply because it. it at, when they hear the gospel, it makes them feel so unworthy and so undeserving. Or, or you may have people, and, and I've, I've, I've preached <laughs> many times around the globe uh, to many people, and I can tell you that there is one common theme among those that hear the gospel. They say, well, I just don't think God can forgive me. God can't possibly forgive me. Uh, you, uh, you just don't know what I've done. You don't know the depths of sin you don't know the, the, the uh, habitual sinful acts that I've done. You don't, you know, and people can get their minds filled with that. Listen, 
God only saves one way. He saves by grace, which means it is not on you at all, anything. You know the expression everybody uses, well, that's on me, that's on me. Listen, with God, nothing is on you. Nothing is on you. It is all on him. I mean, literally, this is what grace is. So if you feel undeserving of salvation, you feel undeserving that God should give you any gift at all. You feel undeserving that God should bankrupt heaven in order to provide deliverance from guilt and shame and sin and the penalty of sin and all that stuff for you. If you feel unworthy, unjustified of this and undeserving, you are 100% qualified to have your hands out like this for God to place salvation there. That's the receiving end. You see, if it was the other way around and you and instead of receiving, you had to take or something like this, right? You, you had to somehow earn it. Could you imagine that? Could you imagine if, if, if God said, listen, I'll send my son into this world and uh, I'll, I'll have him die on a cross and I'll have him pay the full penalty for your sins, but you better show yourself worthy and you better show yourself deserving of my love. There's no way. There's absolutely no way. But see, what's in charisma, what's in Dorian, in these two, I know that's weird to be talking these Greek terms, but what's, you have to know what's in this idea of gift, that it's free because the one who gave it is gracious at his very nature. Gracious giving, wants to do this, knows exactly what you need, knows exactly what your heart is crying out to him for. Even if you don't understand it, he's packaged it, he's delivered it to you, absolutely. Now, <clears throat> Paul uh, then writes elsewhere. So we started in Romans chapter six, we went back over here to Romans chapter three. Can we split the difference a little bit and go to Romans chapter four? And verses four and five, because this, this really ties in. You, know, you don't even need me to explain this to you. I could just say, hey, read this, read this, read this. Follow this little path, right? Romans four, four and five. Now to the one who works. And what he's going to do is contrast then. So you work and what do you get for your work? And what about the one who doesn't work? What do you get for that? Now listen, listen. So this is so counterintuitive because in the real world, if I don't work, I don't get a paycheck. If you don't work, you don't get a paycheck. Uh, if you're the boss and somebody doesn't work, you say, see ya, goodbye. I'm gonna find somebody who wants to work because I need this job to be done. But the thing is with salvation, the job has already been done, so there's no work left to do. He's, God isn't looking for people to hire to do a job so that he can pay them. He's looking for people who are willing to receive freely as a gift what he has already done, finished, packaged. And because of his gracious nature and merciful heart, wants to give that to us. Well, look again at Romans 4, 4, and 5. Now to the one who works, just, just simple, real life stuff. Paul's saying, hey, hey um, so, so let's say somebody works, what do they get? He said, well, his wages are not counted as a gift. No, no, you just think about it. You just had a work week passed and you received your paycheck or had it direct deposited or however you get it. You weren't thinking, wasn't that nice of my employer to give that gift to me? No, you're thinking, I might have a nice employer. I'm thankful for the job, but I worked and the terms of my work are such that if I work, I get this rate of pay equals this amount at the end of the week. That's how it works. But then Paul says, but um, as, his, as his due, right? As his due, not as a gift, but as his due. Um, that is, this is what the, your employer owes you, owes you, right? And, but now Paul says, uh, and or but to the one who does not work. Now, this is what the counterintuitive stuff is. This is in the spiritual realm, right? Because the job has already been done, right? So there's no work to do. So he says, to the one who does not work. And he's really saying, this is how you receive the free gift by not working because there's no job to do. I have to keep repeating this because it takes a while to get through the, the concrete here. And to the one who does not work, but believes, 
believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith or her faith is counted unto them as righteousness. So, so a Christian, by Paul's definition and biblically, uh, by any definition, a Christian, someone who has believed the good news, that good news about Jesus Christ, when he said on the cross, it is finished, he meant the job is done. I completed it, so you don't have to. More than that, I completed it, so you can't. I completed it, so stop trying to do my job. This is what Jesus would say. That cross has an occupancy of one, one. So it's, it's done, it's, it's done, it's completed. So the Christian is characterized or identified simply in terms of belief. What do you believe? What do you believe? The Christian is someone who's believed the good news that God, God offers to justify sinners because of his provision of his own son, Jesus, to do for us what we could not do, and that is to provide the righteousness that we don't have. All right, just a little bit more about that in a minute, because when you start using words like justify and righteousness, you go, whoa, Doug, you lost me there. You know, I like the part about, I get forgiveness, I get, I get the thing that my sins go away and, and all that, but now, you, now you, I don't know what language you're speaking, you start using words like justify or righteousness, you lost me. But God delivers to us, this is salvation, what he has provided for us at no cost, he delivers what we do not have, but what we need, and that's his righteousness. We can't earn this, we, we don't deserve it, yet God at his own expense packaged this gift in his son, wrapped it up and delivered it right to our door. I mean, Amazon can't do that, right? This is what God has done. So, so words like justify, redemption, these are righteousness, stuff like this. They're very in intimidating, uh, if not confusing. But, but, but well, let's talk about just justify for a moment because this is what scripture has told us, right? Uh, we're justified freely or as a gift, as a free gift through the redemption that's in Christ Jesus. So we have to unpack that a little bit so we can appreciate it more. And if we haven't received it, then we say, yeah, okay, uh, that's what I, I believe now. Haven't, haven't had it explained to me. That's what I believe. And in believing it, you what? You, re, you receive it passively, right? Because it's handed to you. So to justify someone uh, in this context means to vindicate them, to acquit them. So if you're going to be somebody who's justified, you first have to be guilty of something. And so the Bible says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And then 623, that's 323 of Romans, 623 we read a moment ago, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God, the charisma, is, is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Um, to justify means we first have to be guilty of something, but then God comes along because of this gift, because of what he's provided through the redemption of his son, he acquits the guilty, all right? So um, we think, well, well how, how is it that God can, can just acquit us? How is it that he can forgive someone of all of their wrongdoing? Because that's what the word acquit means. You, you've committed all these crimes, and then God, uh, crimes against God anyway, crimes against God, but then God comes along and he dismisses those and he forgives, but, but how? How can God do that? He, 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 he just can't do that and be just and be fair in dismissing without any penalty whatsoever. So this is where the term redemption comes in. Uh, it refers to someone being set free or delivered because someone else paid the price to deliver you. Someone else um, took the penalty on your behalf. Someone else stood in your place. So does all this sound familiar to the New Testament? But this is what Jesus did. He came into this world 
He came in this world to take our place, to be punished for us, to absorb all of our guilt, all of our shame. And this is what he did on the cross so that we could be justified. We could be acquitted, right? He was condemned. We are acquitted. He was judged. We were acquitted. Do you see how this this works? So God poured out all of his wrath against sin on his son so that we could could go free. We could have all of the benefits where he had all of the condemnation. This is how God can be just in setting guilty sinners free. So someone else intervened on our behalf. Someone else chose to be associated with with our crime. So the sinner is asked only in all of this. You know, what of the sinner? He's asked only to believe. The good news is put out there and you're asked only to believe. To believe is to to receive. Um, Well, what to believe? Not just that, that deliverance is possible, but that it is available as a gift through what Jesus has done. Now listen to this, because um, there's a difference between possibility and availability, okay? Potential and reality, possibility, availability. There's a difference there, right? Because you could be that type of person who might think, well, I, I, I know I really realize it. I, I look at my life and I, and I realize, Doug, Doug, you know, you've sinned. You've done things that are wrong. I, I know people and I know myself. We've done things that are wrong. These are sins. Surely if there's a God... I have I've messed it up so bad and, and so often. And, and you, might, you might think, well, okay, so salvation, deliverance, forgiveness, uh, to, to be justified, to be acquitted, that's, that, that's all possible. Possible. But, but, but not for me, okay? Because you, you, you don't know who I am. You don't know my thoughts. You don't know my motives. You don't even know my sins of the past week. Doug, Doug, you don't know any of that. But I'm not asking you to think of what is possible or to believe that what is possible. And God's not saying, just put your faith in what is possible. Put your faith in what is real. Put your faith in what is available. Reach out and God's gonna put in your hands this great salvation that you experience in terms of eternal life and a new life in him. So so upon believing, The sinner is set free to become God's adopted child. Think of that, a sinner outside the family of God, right? But now, because of what Jesus did on that cross for us, and by rising from the dead, now we're we're drawn in close to God, and we're included in his family. God adopts us in. This is, again, not merited. It's, it's not at all merited. You can't work for it. As hard as you're trying to work to please God, you cannot work that hard and you cannot do enough because you cannot undo the damage that sin has done. And that's what the cross has completed and finished so that God can justify you. And he does this willingly, graciously, freely to welcome you into his family. God wants you in his family if you will but believe the good news that the job is done so you don't have to do it, the benefit is there, freedom from sin, if you will receive it. So upon believing, then the sinner just is acquitted, receives full pardon for all crimes against God. So this is really what salvation means more than just a slogan i'm saved well what does that really mean in terms of the experience of your life to live in terms of of being an adopted child of god god is your father you have jesus as your savior the holy spirit who lives within you as your guide and the empowerment to live this christian life um so This new life in Jesus begins at the point of believing and not doing. Believing, 
Believe the good news. That's the good news. It wouldn't be good news if God gave you a whole list of things that you have to do, standards that you have to achieve, hoops through which you have to jump. What kind of salvation is that? It would be so far out of reach, no one could ever attain it. So God, instead of asking us to come to him, he came to us, did he not? Um, so here's a new life that begins now and then continues, continues uh, one day after physical death with God in heaven. So that's, that's what eternal life means. So listen to the words of Jesus. Um, he's at a graveside. He's at the graveside of a sister mourning the loss of her brother. Um, her brother had been placed in a tomb now. Now four days have have gone by. She had hoped that Jesus would have come uh, and, and, and healed her brother, but, but now her brother was dead. And, and uh, Jesus used this occasion, this difficult occasion. I mean, can you imagine this? But he uses this difficult occasion to teach uh, kind of a real life example that true life or eternal life can only be found in him and is only obtainable through a relationship with him or, or from him or however you want to understand that. So Jesus says, and this is John 11 and verse 25, where he says, I am the resurrection and the life. And before we continue, I just want to focus on those two words, I am, um, because what Jesus is trying to say in, the, in, this ter- in this expression, I am, which again, we have to look at the Greek and I think it's important that we do because for us just to say, I am, I am this, I am that, I am whatever, um, you know, we just understand that in the English language and we get it and it's, it's really not that significant except that the person is trying to say, uh, you know, point to themselves, I need you to know something about me, I am this. So with Jesus, he's trying to, to say something like, um, I am uh, exclusively this. Okay, so, so if I tell you, tell you something as, as Doug and I say well I am a good this or I am a bad this or I, I am something you'd say yeah yeah you and and a whole bunch of other people we're right there with you but you know when Jesus says I am he means this exclusively and he means this emphatically he uses these words ego ego which is which is I and then I mean the verb which is I am you know so I I am sounds very very strange but it's a way in Greek that you would convey what Jesus is saying. I am exclusively this and I am emphatically this. In other words, because I am exclusively this, this, then I say this emphatically because what I am is what you need. I say it emphatically so you don't miss the point that because of who I am and this matches what you need, don't miss it. You know, like, like an exclamation point after it. Like, don't miss this. Um, so seven times in John's gospel, this is John eleven twenty five. 25, but seven times, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door of the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life, which he says here, and we'll finish the verse in a moment. I am the way, the truth of the life, and I am the true vine. And all of these comprehensively are to tell us that Jesus is exclusively and emphatically the source of new life, that you can search everywhere for the meaning of life. You can search everywhere to fill this void in your life that is just generating all of this turbulence and distress and anxiety and fears and, and doubts and, and any number of things, the, the thing that's driving you to, be, to behaviors that are self-destructive, all of it. And you subsume it as your need. And what is the need to fill that void, to, to satiate that, that sort of craving that you have that just won't go away? And that's Jesus. Jesus is saying, and he says it seven different ways and seven different times, look to me, look to me. I am what you're seeking. You need eternal life. And you can find in the Gospel of John, whether it's a woman sitting by Jacob's well in Sychar who, is, who has been, um, what, uh, 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 um, uh, driven out of, of 
her social, uh, how do you say it? You know, um, she, she's driven away from society. Um, you can see just, just so many people in the Gospel of John that Jesus approached whose life was just trashed and, and a wreckage or, or who were just caught up in some type of a, of, of a religious mentality, like, like Nicodemus who thought, I can just go to the temple so many times, I can offer this many sacrifices, I can try to obey the commandments of God's word and then God will, will be happy with Jesus says, except a man is born again, he, he won't enter the kingdom of God. So Nicodemus, all that religion isn't gonna help you. And to this woman by Jacob's well, all that sin is not going to ultimately uh, uh, be your ruin if you'll look to me, if you'll, trust, if you'll trust in me. So there is something obtainable only in Jesus that we need, namely eternal life, new life, the ability to live with God and we can't live with God if we have guilt, shame, and sin. That's why we need Jesus. That's why Jesus had to go to the cross. That's why we need to, hands held out, we need to receive from him, not earn from him and obligate him. No, he did this all graciously, freely on our behalf. So here in John eleven twenty five. 25, Jesus is going to speak to a sister that was deeply distressed, deeply disappointed in Jesus because he, he hadn't arrived in time, you know, to, to, to save her brother, different context of save, to heal him from this illness so that he wouldn't die, but now he's dead and he's entombed already and they're, they're mourning the loss and weeping all around the, the scene there at the tomb but you add to this that, that she had in fact sent messengers and Jesus was just, just you, know, you know, down the Mount of Olives, across the Kidron, you know, up into Jerusalem. He's just over there, they're in Bethany. And here's a place where she, Martha and her sister Mary and the brother Lazarus who's, who's dead, these are the people that entertained Jesus and the disciples in their home. They were friends, and now she sent messages to Jesus. Surely you've healed, you've healed so many. We've seen you heal so many. So, so just, just one more. Just come and heal this one that you love. This is not some stranger that we know. This is one that you love. Come heal him. And of course, she's thinking, just disappointed. You, you didn't do it. You didn't do it. So, so if you were Jesus, you know, what, what could you say now to this woman? Or, or what could you do to comfort her, to bring some, some hope to this grieving sister? I mean, Jesus couldn't, it's not like Jesus could just walk in and, and undo the damage. But you, you, it's too late for you to heal him now. You, you can't do that. So, so why are you here? Do you want to join with the mourners? You know, why, why are you here? You. You, who I've, I've seen you, you heal others, but you didn't heal him. I mean, what are you going to do? Are you going to like undo what's been done? I mean, he's dead. Are you going to undo that? <laughs> but this sorrowing sister, yeah, one of a pair of sisters, right? Mary and Martha. Uh was going to learn a very valuable lesson about Jesus at this point. That physical death just doesn't intimidate Jesus. Physical death does not limit God in any way. Not only the sisters, but Lazarus is going to learn something as well. And all of those religious leaders that were standing around were going to learn something as well. That physical death is no barrier to one who is the author of life and one who bestows not only physical life, but eternal life. So Jesus says here, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever, whoever. Um, and remember that this idea of whoever is key to our understanding of salvation. Whoever, it's basically anyone. No one is excluded from salvation. Whoever, no qualifications because we're all 
unqualified. We are all undeserving. But he says, whoever, what's the word, believes. There's no works to do. There, there's nothing to earn or to obligate God. It's just, again, the word belief. Whoever believes in me or rests confidently in me, just trust my words, trust in what I've done for you, even though they die, even though they die physically, just like Martha's brother. Jesus might have pointed to the tomb. And so even though, if you believe in me, even though you die pointing at that tomb, they shall live. In other words, they shall live, um, um, continue to live eternally. So there is hope beyond the grave. Any one of us that have lost a loved one who believed in what Jesus is saying about himself and received that gift of salvation, they live on. Physical death is not a barrier to a life with God. And we have to understand this. So uh, I am the resurrection of life. Whoever believes in me, even though they die physically, they shall live, they shall continue to live eternally. But then he switches back and says, and everyone who lives, who lives now physically and believes in me now shall never die eternally. So if you're concerned about death and then what, you know, back up to the cross and what Jesus did because that secures the then what and that is our victory over physical death. Life does not end with the grave. And so this is what Jesus is trying to, to tell her. And then Jesus asks Martha the all-important question, do you believe this? So Martha is having her fundamental beliefs challenged in terms of physical death and the resurrection or life to come or what happens after, after death. And Jesus is trying to say that anyone that believes in me receives now eternal life so that at physical death, it's no barrier, but that eternal life continues on with God in his presence. So we, we call Christians believers, not because they're in some kind of occultic trance, you know, <laughs> they're, they're, they're believers because they're convinced that Jesus is all that they need, that Jesus is the gift that defines who they are both now and in eternity to come. So, um, you know, what's, what's packaged in this gift? You know, well, there's a right standing with God, to be sure. We're justified. We're, we're acquitted. We're adopted into his family. So belief in Jesus is, is what now characterizes this one, myself, perhaps you, uh, who's, who's formerly a sinner, formerly characterized as a sinner, now characterized as a believer, one who has received forgiveness, release from the guilt and shame of sin, one who is identified with the Lord Jesus, one who is now in God's family. So I don't know if you're still seeking or not, if you're still looking. If you're looking, if, if somehow what you need is not been described to you this morning in terms of the good news, um, I think you're seeking for something in vain. Don't seek, don't look, believe. Believe what Jesus is saying. So I just want to say in a couple minutes as we close, um, there's more in the box. So we started in Acts 2.38, and indeed there is more in the box than just mere salvation from sin, right? So salvation from sin, we say, okay, fine, that helps me in the, uh, not in the here and now, but in the by and by, you know, in, in the future. So, so great, I know I'm forgiven, I'm, I'm gonna be with God in heaven, Jesus is my savior and all of that. But what about the here and now? How do you live this Christian life? So Acts 2.38, repent, be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So, so, so yes, yes, okay, okay, we get it, Peter. Peter, we get it, um, that we need to repent 
if our sins are going to be forgiven. Okay, so Paul talks about that as well. Nothing new. Jesus talks about that. Nothing new. And, and yes, baptism. Baptism, we understand that. Not a requirement for salvation, but it's a symbol of, um, really an outer demonstration of an inner reality. So the ritual demonstrates the reality of the new birth. Uh, forgiveness of sins is, is um, uh, not effectuated by water, but it's demonstrated through the, the, the ritual, a cleansing, a purification of sin. All this comes when we repent. But at the same time, we receive we receive the gift, and here um, Luke is the author of Acts who records Peter's sermon, and he uses this term Dorian again for someone who's unworthy, undes undeserving. So even in salvation, at that moment of salvation, eternal life, freedom from sin, shame, guilt, penalty, anything associated with sin, free from it, right? But then also we receive this gift of the Holy Spirit. The God who delivers a gift of salvation to your door also includes in the box everything you need so that it will operate fully in your life. So he doesn't just say, well, here's the box, here's your salvation. Inside the box, there's an instruction manual. That's the Bible. So you've got salvation and you've got the Bible, but there's no batteries included, you know? so in a sense, yes. Okay, so the batteries are included. In other words, the power source to make this thing work, but the Holy Spirit is so much more than, than just a power source. He's a person, he's a guide, he's a comforter, he's a, he's a friend. Um, he's someone that, 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 that's gonna help us to accomplish everything that's incumbent upon us for this new life. He wants us to experience the fullness of, of what salvation is. So if you've received a gift recently and you receive that and you're appreciative of it and you're thankful for it, and boy, if that gift just hits the sweet spot, you know, that's just the thing you were looking for. You're just so thrilled and excited to be able to have that, to be able to have that gift become part of your, of your life. And that's how God wants us to understand the gift of salvation. It's just what we needed. And in fact, this gift redefines our life. It's a gift of, of all gifts. So rejoice in the experiencing of God's great gift uh, through the good news of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray, shall we? Heavenly Father, thank you for helping us understand not only the facts about the gospel, everything that you did because of your gracious nature to set us free from the judgment, the condemnation, the shame, the guilt, the penalty of sin, but free to, a, to experience a new life. We want to experience that gift because of everything that's in the box. We don't want to leave anything out. And part of that is to come to know the Holy Spirit, your personal presence inside of us, instructing us, leading us, guiding us, strengthening us, giving us the power to live and to do when we feel overwhelmed. The Holy Spirit is there to embolden us, to strengthen us for a new day. Thank you for this as we uh, continue on uh, to search your scriptures to find hope, peace, and joy in this new life. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Blessings on you.